Today I'm very pleased to be able to present my work on an analysis of the variety of English taught in German secondary schools and I've entitled this presentation and this paper Schule English, uh, which is a lovely compound noun in German that has school and English as the school English uh, literally and it's a very frequent uh, compound noun that um, you'll even find in, in the Duden and it is defined as um, the English knowledge that is acquired at school. And it's actually um, a term that I found in a large corpus of uh, web German as well, um, in lots of interesting contexts. And um, I wanted to bring this one to the fore, school English and the original um, two worlds collide. And so there is um, this uh, perception very often in German speaking countries that this school English, school English, is somehow different to naturally occurring English, to original English, to authentic or real life English in some way that's not been really defined. Um, uh, so far. And so I'm very interested in the language of textbooks in general and in this particular uh, study I'm focusing on German school English as a foreign language textbooks. Why? Well simply because um, textbooks in Germany and really across Europe at least uh, are very central to uh, English language teaching. Um, we know that input is very important for um, second language learning and teaching and um, the textbook forms the main source uh, of input in the second language classroom. Now of course textbooks now come in all kinds of forms, so it's really a textbook package which includes uh, audio material, video materials, um, apps and so on and so forth. So uh, my research questions uh, are first of all um, to what extent Schule English varies across um, different registers, um, across different textbook proficiency levels and across um, textbook series. And then, of course, I'm interested in um, the extent to which Schule English differs, and if so, how Schule English differs from the kind of naturally occurring English that learners can be expected to encounter and use um, outside the EFL classroom. So you can imagine that I need some data to do that. On the one hand, some um, tool English, some um, textbook um, data, and on the other hand, some kind of data to represent naturally occurring extracurricular English. So let's begin uh, with the um, textbook English corpus. Um, this is a large corpus of textbooks um, that I actually compiled as part of my PhD. And the full corpus has 42 textbook volumes and nine textbook series in three different countries, or from three different countries. In this study, I'm focusing on the German subcorpus, um, and that's three textbook series, nine textbook volumes. What is um, special about this corpus is that I've identified text units within each textbook textbook volume and I've manually annotated those for textbook register and those are the registers that I identified and annotated. Now in terms of um, comparison I'm uh, looking at three different reference corpora. Um, on the one hand the, a youth um, fiction corpus which I can pardon ourselves with um, extracts from 300 novels targeted at um, teenagers and young adults. Um, on the other hand a conversation um, reference corpus that's the spoken BNC 2014 that many of you will be familiar with um, and finally an informative website for teens corpus uh, which I compiled using um, well, from websites uh, for English speakers um, but specifically targeted at teenagers. So this enables me to have these um, three register based comparisons um, as well. Now, very briefly about the methods, um, I was very interested in trying to get a broad understanding of what represents Schule English, and to this end I ended up um, looking at the uh, MDA framework, that's multidimensional analysis, um, a method de developed by um, Douglas Biber, and I'm sure uh, many of you will be familiar with the book from 1988. Um, very, very briefly, the method involves, uh, first of all, compiling a large um, corpus that represents the full varieties um, that um, you want to study, and in this case, in Biber's case, it was um, full varieties of register varieties of written and spoken English. And then for each of these um, texts in this large corpus, um, it's necessary to uh, identify, tag and count then um, a broad range of linguistic features. So we end up with a very large table uh, for every single text. We have frequency counts for all kinds of different uh, linguistic features. And we can from that computer correlation matrix um, of frequencies across all the text in the corpus. And so this is what um, an annotated text might look like. You can see that for every single word I have um, one or more um, tag. 
and then these um, tags are counted um, and um, we compute standardized uh, normalized frequencies and end up with a correlation matrix that um, looks something like this. Now this is high dimensional data and this is not the sort of thing that a human can interpret and so this is where um, a statistical method is used to reduce that dimensionality to just a few dimensions that explain hopefully a large amount of the shared variance in that um, correlation matrix. And um, that's not where it ends because of course once you have uh, extracted these main dimensions of variation within um, the corpus then it's necessary to interpret them. So uh, in my work I've been using a sort of revised MDA framework, um, made quite a few changes um, which I don't have time to go into right now. Um, for a lot of these changes, I've ended up um, implementing them in a tagger, uh, the multi-feature tagger of English, which um, you can find on GitHub. In this study, I used the Perl version, um, but there is now a Python version, which I've developed to, uh, together with uh, Mohamed Shakir, um, for which I can send a link as well, uh, which I recommend using rather than this older Perl version. And essentially all of these aspects are sort of constitute um, the revised MDA framework aim at increasing both the replicability and the reproducibility of um, the analysis. And so you can find all the details in um, the online appendix to my PhD, uh, which um, is uh, online and con contains all of the, the code and so on and so forth. But I would like um, to um, present a few results. So. As a reminder, we're looking at three textbook series used in Germany, that's 15 um, textbooks in total, and um, three reference corpora, so a total of over 4,000 texts, and 73 um, mostly lexical grammatical features and a few semantic features too. I ended up um, choosing uh, a model with three dimensions. Um, and so this is what this model looks like on um, a three-dimensional plot. Every single text represents, every single point rather represents a text on, on this plot. And um, it's probably a little bit difficult to discern at this stage, um, but what we have here um, are really um, three clusters that are quite clearly defined, um, a dark blue one, a red and a green. And then uh, clustered towards the middle, we have the textbook text, with one exception, and that's the orange that you can see here. Um, those are instructional um, texts from the textbooks, and they are very different on one dimension, namely on the third um, dimension. But it is rather difficult um, to see this on a three-dimensional plot, so let's move to two dimensions. Um, this is the same thing on the first and second dimension only, and uh, again, every single point represents a text. Now I've also added some um, ellipses that represent 90% confidence intervals around the mean of each um, sub-corpus. Um, and what we can see again are the three ellipses from the reference corpora here, um, the large one in dark blue from the informative um, teens corpus, um, in dark uh, green, the reference corpus for fiction, and in dark red for conversation. And we can see that um, these do not overlap on this combination of the first and second dimension. However, we see that the textbooks corpora do um, overlap quite a bit in, uh, in the middle of the plot here. This first dimension on the x-axis accounts for a large chunk of the uh, variance. Um, it's very similar to Viber's first dimension. It represents um, a continuum between um, highly interactional, spontaneous spoken English on the one hand, and then uh, informative, dense um, written language on the other. And what we can see is that we have on this dimension quite a lot of overlap uh, for the informative register between the textbook language in purple and the um, uh, reference informative um, texts. Um, but we still see a shift of the textbook ellipsis towards the middle of the plot, so towards um, the more spoken end of the dimension. Um, and by contrast, if we turn to the conversation uh, register, here we see very little overlap between the reference conversational data and the textbook um, dialogues. And this includes, the textbook data includes the transcripts of the audio and video materials um, from the textbooks. Very little overlap here, and this um, yellow ellipsis is, is very much shifted towards um, the more informative written end of the dimension as compared to um, the spoken BNC 2014. Um, the second dimension um, that we see here um, is also very similar to by the second dimension. It's um, a contrast between the fictional register. Um, so here we see a lot of overlap actually between 
and the textbook data, which is the light green ellipsis, and the reference fictional data. But again, the textbook ellipsis is very much shifted towards the center of the plot. So a lot of overlap um, between these different textbook registers, some register-based variation, but a lot less than in the reference data. We can look at the features that contribute to uh, the positions of these texts on these two dimensions. This is a plot of features, again, on the first and second dimension, and you can imagine it as being superimposed on um, the scatter plot of text, something like this, so that the features um, that are towards this end are the ones um, that are very frequent in the text that we find in this area of the graph. And so, for instance, we see that informative texts have a high density of nouns, of prepositions, longer words on average, high lexical density. And the um, highly conversational text, um, spontaneous, interactional um, language, have a lot of um, verbal contractions, discourse markers, um, yes-no questions, negation, demonstrative pronouns, and so on and so forth. I've also um, looked at these dimension scores across um, different uh, factors that might drive uh, variation. And so on this first dimension, uh, what we see is that register plays a very important role. Um, register is the main driver of variation on this first dimension. Um, by contrast, um, the textbook series, um, we see no significant difference and very, very small uh, estimates here. The um, textbook proficiency level does play a role for informative text. Um, here we find that informative texts in beginner textbooks, I mean, they're very rare, and when they do um, occur, we, we do see that um, they are more like um, spoken language in the textbooks, and they become more similar to the reference data as um, textbook proficiency increases, so as we expect students uh, to be more proficient in English. On the conversational end, um, we have two um, things going on here. On the one hand, we have some features that are very typical of um, spoken English that are rarer in textbook dialogues. Um, so we have um, fewer contractions, we have less negation, uh, fewer uh, demonstrative pronouns, uh, some of the features that are here. But um, the main effect is actually that we have more features that are typical of informative written language in the textbook dialogues than we would expect. Um, and so it's really also uh, higher frequencies of these features that lead to um, the textbook dialogue text being shifted towards the middle of the plot. Um, and here we see uh, no effect of textbook proficiency levels. So it's not as if the texts are becoming more natural-like as textbook proficiency is increasing. Um, that is not what we can observe um, here. And it's uh, very interesting to look at the the, the text themselves um, to see what those features are and in what context um, they occur. I'd just like to briefly mention the third dimension. Um, this um, is dimension that I've plotted here on the y-axis. So here, um, this is the first dimension again, and, um, and on the y-axis I now have the third dimension, which explains about 7% of the variance in the data, and I've uh, interpreted this dimension as a um, didacticized versus natural English um, dimension. And that's because we really see that the reference data here scores around the same um, sort of scores on this dimension, and the uh, textbook data is um, scores much lower. And so we have these shifts in and um, these ellipses, the textbook um, Dialogue data is very much shifted towards the negative end of this dimension, and most negative scores are the instructional texts um, that are very clearly defined as a specific register with very specific linguistic characteristics on this um, dimension. What are those characteristics? Um, you won't be very surprised uh, when you see them. Um, they are um, the, the ones that we would expect to find in this kind of instructional uh, language. Imperative verbs are very frequent. We find a lot of um, occurrences of uh, second person references, of uh, yes and no questions, WH questions, um, um, and the likes. So for instructional language, not so surprising, it's interesting to see that the um, other textbook registers are also um, scoring lower on this dimension. And that's because um, very typical Schul English uh, language includes a lot of imperative verbs, for instance, um, but also includes um, a lot of um, uh, references to um, second person pronouns and a lot of questions as well. Uh, on this third dimension, we see a very clear effect for uh, proficiency level, not so much for register. There is um, very little, in fact, or hardly any 
um, variation driven by register here, but very much by um, textbook proficiency level. And you can see that um, the greatest differences are with the beginner textbooks, so all um, three registers that I've got here, and as um, learners are expected to become more proficient in English, then we find that the texts on this dimension resemble much more the reference data. So that's an encouraging finding, I would say. Uh, here's an example of an informative text um, that scores uh, relatively low on this third dimension. It's from a, a textbook used in the second year of uh, English tuition at uh, secondary school. And one of the main features of this um, third dimension is also um, the use of can as a modal. And um, by opposition, higher texts that should score higher on this third dimension use pretty much all other modals um, apart from can. Um, and, and can really seems to be the modal of choice in uh, Schul English. So we can see lots of those. We also see um, lots of occurrences of you. We also find lots of questions. And those are some of the features that are very typical of Schul English on this um, third dimension. So very um, uh, briefly, uh, what can we conclude? in terms of Schul English, that it does vary um, across text registers, in particular on this first dimension, which explains the most um, variation. So it is an important source of variation. Um, some uh, variation can also be attributed to textbook proficiency level. And um, in my study, um, hardly any, uh, pretty much no uh, differences could be seen across the textbook series. How does Schul English differ? In lots of different ways. Um, the main finding is probably that register variation is much more constrained in um, textbooks as compared to uh, sort of extracurricular English. Um, and there are some features that are typical of Schul English, which include can as a modal, uh, which include um, uh, questions, and both yes-no questions and WH questions, the high frequency of imperative, not only in instructional language, but also in the other text registers in the textbook. Um, those are some of the features that are very typical of Schul English. And of course, Schul English is characterized by an absence or um, the much rarer use of some complex, uh, especially syntactic features, which um, we only find in the more advanced um, textbooks. Methodological implications, um, I haven't uh, really had a chance to talk about, um, but we certainly see that we need to account for register and proficiency level based variation when we look at the language of textbooks and when we look at Schul English. And I think there are also uh, implications in terms of materials design that probably need to be more corpus based and need to take register variation more into account. Um, I'm very interested in the use of corpora for materials design. I invite you to have a look at this um, open educational resource, this ebook that I co-created with my students, um, which, um, in which we do just that. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.